Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Okay, so I guess everybody knows this. Perhaps I should start like this. Uh, hi, my name is Andrea, and like many of you, I'm obsessed with this Hamiltonian. <laughs> and okay, I, I want to I want to uh, address one question here, uh, and is what is the computational complexity of finding an approximate ground state of this Hamiltonian? And uh, more precisely, what does this mean? Uh, <coughs> we want the following. Uh, for any fixed uh, accuracy epsilon, we want an algorithm that takes as input the matrix of coupling, the n by n matrix of couplings, and output a plus minus one vector that is a function of this uh, you know, coupling matrix. And this must be, uh, uh, you know, the algorithm must run in polynomial time and must be such the that the energy achieved is bigger than uh, 1 minus epsilon times the energy, the maximum energy that you can achieve with high probability with respect to the choice of the coupling. Uh, so unlike in, in standard physics notation, I'll think of this as a maximization problem instead of as a minimization problem, but of course it's exactly the same. Okay? Does the problem make sense? Epsilon is a constant. It's 0 0.00001, okay, or any arbitrary accuracy. Okay, so so the plan is that I will discuss earlier work, uh, try to explain the algorithm, and then some open problems. So I listed here, uh, you know, four lines of, of related works. Of course, there is many others. Uh, one, of course, a natural idea from physics would be to use some sort of Langevin of Glau or Glauber dynamics. There is, of course, the connection with the message passing and one-step replica symmetry breaking, a connection with computer science, finally with probability theory. I will uh, briefly review all except uh, this one, and the reason is that, not that this is least, less interesting, but it's the most closely connected, and really discussing the connection requires understanding a little bit the technical details of the algorithm. So it's better to do it at the end, eventually. I, I will not talk about the connection with the uh, uh, message passing in 1RSB, in particular with survey propagation and all this line of work that Mark uh, uh, you know, reviewed in the morning, not because that connection is not there, actually it's a strong connection, but, but it's better understood after uh, the algorithm. Okay, so what can computer science tell us about this problem? Uh, so this is optimizing a quadratic form over the hypercube. If the matrix is arbitrary, and I wrote A here just to mean that this is arbitrary, uh, there is a, you know, a wealth of computational complexity result. One of the most best known is this by Aurora et al. and says the following, unless P is equal to NP, that nobody believes or most people don't believe is true, there is no polynomial time algorithm that can approximate the you know, ground state better than within a factor one over polylog. Okay? So say that the ground state energy is 1, you cannot achieve better than 1 over log n to some small power. Mm -hmm. So this is... Well, okay, here in reality I'm cheating. This, this constant here, 0 0.01, is some fixed epsilon. In the, in the paper, you don't, you don't, they don't derive what is the epsilon, but they show that there is a positive small constant here such that this is impossible. No? Small n is the number of spins, sorry. Small n is the same as capital N. Okay? So from a worst case perspective, this problem is very hard to solve, very hard to approximate, even very roughly. Uh, of course, the limitation of this result is that this is a worst case result, so it doesn't tell necessarily anything about the SK model. Okay? So let's look at what the computer scientist would do. It might be interesting to, to see what would be their, their typical algorithm. So you want to optimize this function. Uh, by, by far the most popular approach to this, at least within, within the optimization community, is the following. You relax the problem, and uh, the, best, the you know, best known or most celebrated relaxation is the Gomans-Williams relaxation. You replace the plus minus one spin by spins that lie on the unit sphere in capital N dimension. Okay? So instead of working with a spin model with icing spin, you work with a model with vector spin. So it might not look now completely obvious from this way of writing it, but solving this problem is easy. 
In fact, this turns out to be a convex problem if you parameterize it in the right way. So this can be solved efficiently. Now you are given a ground state this, of this vector model. What do you do with it? Uh, well, Gomez Williamson came up with this idea. You take a random direction, S0, uniformly at random on the sphere, and you project the spins on that direction. Okay? So basically, in other words, you obtain a solution that are spins in the unit sphere in capital N dimension. You take a random hyperplane. All that is on the right of the hyperplane, you declare a plus one. All that is on the left, you declare a minus one. And this actually, this, this type of relaxation dates back in mathematics all the way to uh, growth and Dick. You can analyze this in worst case, and of course doesn't beat the Aurora et al. result. You can analyze it for the SK Hamiltonian. Actually, this is, you know, there is no paper that does it formally, but is a consequence of a result in this paper. And you obtain that Gomans Williamson relaxation achieves 2 over pi, which is about 0.63. And this is, of course, to be compared with the ground state energy that anybody knows by our heart is 0 0.67, oh, 7, 6, 3, 1, 6, 6. I forgot the 6. OK, so, so this approach doesn't give you, uh, give you something, but not a very good approximation of the ground state. A natural idea that, that we can have as a physicist is to use Glauber dynamics of Langevin dynamics. So to spell it out, it means the following. I fix some large temperature, uh, large inverse temperature, beta naught, that will depend on my accuracy epsilon. I fix some large time, and then I, la I, run, uh, I run Glauber dynamics for that time at that temperature. And how do you hope to analyze that, that uh, algorithm? Well, we know that we can, we can try to write uh, some mean field equation for the correlation and the response function. And this is what's done, uh, you know, starting from work by Leticia and Horgan in the 90s. Okay? So now this might or might not converge to the ground state. Let's say that it does converge to the ground state. Still, I would argue that I'm not very happy with this solution. Uh, first of all, analyzing this requires not only writing the equation for C and R, but requires also guessing what is the asymptotics of this equation, okay? And this is you know, a tricky business, and we know of examples in which this is not obvious. And more importantly, this is in general not the right algorithm for this type of problems. Uh, for instance, if you take a mixed p-spins, we know that this doesn't achieve uh, you know, the best possible approximation. For instance, there is this work by Federico Silvio that shows that in mixed p-spin, spherical p-spin, if you change the you know, cooling schedule, you can change the temperature that you achieve. So simply, this, this algorithm will not achieve the best possible approximation. So it's not somehow the canonical or the right algorithm for this type of problems. Finally, there is a, a last line of work that, that uh, you know, came up over last year with probability theory. And in particular, these two papers, one by Luigi Dario Berri and, and uh, Pascal Maillard, uh, who analyzed the generalized RAM in a case in which it's full RSB and come up with an algorithm that finds a near ground state in polynomial time. And the other by Eliran that considers the mixed spherical P-spin and shows, you know, obtains a very, very elegant algorithm that, uh, again, achieves, in the case in which it is full RSB, a near ground state in pro polynomial time. Mm -hmm. And these are very nice papers, very beautiful papers. Both of them, it's fair to say that they use quite heavily the structure of the model. So in particular, the fact that the Gram, OK, it's a, it's a particularly you know, explicit model in a way. And the spherical model has a, has a lot of symmetry. Okay. So what, what I'm talking about today is a, is a new result. And uh, so the result holds under an assumption. And the assumption, yeah. You mentioned Grothendieck. Ah. Yeah, so Grothendieck, uh, sorry, uh, please, the question. So, so Grothendieck has a paper in functional analysis where, where he has the following problem. Uh, the problem is a bit different, but is maximizing sigma transpose a two over sigma and two in plus minus one. And then uh, is basically studies study something that is the relaxation of this that is sum over ij 
AIJ uh, UI BJ, where, where the UI BJ are in the sphere. And it shows that there is a constant uh, uh, factor approximation between the two. So if you, you, know, if you, do, if you do this, this is an SDP. This is opt. So of course, you have that opt is less or equal than SDP. And it proves that this is bigger than a constant times SDP. Okay. So this is a slightly different problem because it's a bipartite problem. And in this case, this relaxation achieves a constant factor approximation. It doesn't talk about algorithms, but uh, I don't know. It analyzes this for some functional analysis reasons. But then this was rediscovered by uh, Noga Alon and Asaf Naor in the 2000s, uh, where they used it as a way to construct algorithms. So this is known, this type of things is known as the Grothendieck inequality, and this is known as the Grothendieck constant, and okay. there is a whole literature about it. Uh, okay. Okay, so the result holds under an assumption, and the assumption, uh, I'll call it an overlap gap, and is the following. Let mu beta be the Parisi measure, and what I mean by, mean by this is, the, is the, the, the probability measure that solves the variational principle, that optimizes the Parisi functional. Okay? So this is a probability distribution over the interval 0, 1. And the assumption is that if the temperature is low enough, the support of this measure is an interval, namely the interval 0 Q star for, for some Q star. Huh? So we took uh, this morning was, was uh, talking about some recent, you know, kind of impressive progress towards this conjecture. And, you know, numerically, is, is everybody believes it's, it's correct, but currently it's open. Okay? So, in other words, we assume that the Parisi measure puts positive mass over this whole interval for some few star. And, and, and the result is, is, is the following, uh, that for any epsilon positive, there exists an algorithm with complexity quadratic in the, in the size and, and you know, depending on epsilon, that achieves one minus epsilon approximation. Okay. So let me now describe the algorithm. And, uh, and for describing the algorithm, I will, I will use the case zero temperature, even if the paper and the proof is written as positive temperature, basically because I don't want to, to carry around this beta factor everywhere and write everywhere there exists a beta. Yeah. Sorry? This one is a high probability statement. So with high probability, we with that, uh, with that probability we, means with the probability converging to one as n goes to infinity. Okay, I, I cannot hope this to hold with probability one because, you know, the Gaussian measure cover all possible matrices. If it holds with probability in one, then it will load for any matrix. And Aurora et al. results says that it is impossible. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, the statement is zero temperature, but if you read the proof, what I do is that I run an algorithm that basically finds, I define an algorithm that finds an approximate solution of top equations at temperature beta for some large beta. And the reason why I, I do this in the, in the proof is that somehow finite a beta simplifies a little bit the analysis of the Paris PD, et cetera, and I could use you know, a, a bunch of results from uh, Aufinger Chen and others about the Paris PD and, and, and so on. Okay, but for this description, I, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll describe the algorithm as purely zero temperature. So, so what, what is the, the energy that we want to achieve? So this is the Parisi formula. Gamma is, is, is the order parameter that Tuca called the new star. I'm sorry for the mismatch. So it's a, it's a uh, non-decreasing function from the interval 0, 1 into R plus. 
uh, you solve this PD, and then the ground state energy is given by the, the, the variational principle is given by this uh, functional of gamma, so the solution at 0, 0, minus the integral between 0 and 1, I'm sorry, typo, of, of the measure. And, uh, and uh, okay, Telegram and then uh, Offinger Chen in, uh, in, uh, in the case of zero temperature proved that the ground state converges to the infimum of this, that is, okay, I keep forgetting this six, sorry. Okay, so we want to achieve, show that we achieve this energy. I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take a pause and describe a problem that might seem complete, completely uh, unrelated. It's uh, what's called a stochastic optimal control problem. Optimal control is about you have a particle that has its dyna dynamics and you try to control it to achieve some target, right? And this is a simple control problem. You have a particle in one dimension that moves according to a velocity field. The velocity field depends on x and on t. And uh, it's also perturbed by Brownian motion. So we have a particle with Brownian motion that moves in one dimension. And you have to design v. You have to define, de design two functions, v and g. This must be Lipschitz. And uh, must be such the following holds. If you integrate gx of s dBs, so against the Brownian motion, uh, what you get is something in the interval minus 1, 1. And the expectation of g is 1 at all times. Okay? So you have this particle that moves in one dimension, and you have to construct a you know, velocity field, so a force that is applied to it, and then a functional g such that at the end, the integral ends up in the interval minus 1, 1, and the power of this g is always 1. Yeah, so the expectation is over the Brownian motion always. And uh, if you give me a pair V or G, hmm, so a pair V or G is admissible if these two constraints are satisfied, and the energy of a pair V and G is the integral of the expectation of G in dt. So, uh, you know, stochastical optimal control problems actually arise in the analysis of the Paris EPD. Uh, this starts with the paper of, uh, I think, Bouvier and Klimovsky, and then Alfinger Chen, and then Jaganato Basco. I tried to check whether this coincides with any of them. I, I think it doesn't coincide exactly with any of them, but it's similar in spirit. This is an example of. of the dynamics of Z for an admissible control. Hmm? Okay, so there is this seemingly unrelated problem, one particle in one direct dimension, and, uh, and uh, the connection between and the, and the SK model is given in two steps. Step number one, I, achieve, I show you that, or I show that if you give me a V and G that are admissible, that satisfy those constraints, uh, and any epsilon positive, there exists an algorithm for the SK model that achieves energy at least as big as the energy of this control problem, VG. Okay, so if you give me, if you can solve this problem of one particle in one dimension, I'll give you an algorithm that achieves the same energy for the SK model. And second, you can find a VG such that this is equal to the Paris constant. Okay? So if you put these two together, you get the main theorem that you can achieve uh, the Parisi energy, the Parisi formula minus epsilon. Okay, step number two, it's, it's uh, basically uh, quite easy uh, in the sense that you know one, one stochastic differential equation that arises in the analysis of the Parisi PD is this one, right? So what you basically do is that you look at this and you choose V to match this equation, okay? My stochastic optimal control problem has this velocity V, so I choose this velocity V exactly to match this equation. And then I choose G as the second derivative of, uh, of the field of, uh, of the Parisi solution, and this turns out to satisfy the constraint. And if you think about it, now this xt for the specific choice has the interpretation 
of having the same distribution as the cavity field with respect to the states as overlap level t. Okay, so there is, you know, this x of t that evolves in time zero one and uh, you know in zero one and at the beginning I didn't have any interpretation, but with the specific setting of the velocity and the control g, what happens is that a given t this x of t will have the same distribution as the cavity field in the, in the SK model. Now, how do I construct an algorithm? The idea is to take this stochastic differential equation and try to implement of, as an algorithm on a finite graph. So first of all, I discretize time. Yeah. At, at, at overlap. Yeah, at least this is, this is my interpretation. But OK, mathematically, what I can say is that this, you know, this is the stochastic differential equation that is associated to the Paris CPD, and this x of t is, you know, follows the, the distribution. Okay? So this is, and then. OK, so I discretize time. And then I replace this SD by n discrete time processes, one per each vertex of the thing. OK, so for each, I don't have any more one process, but I have a whole vector x that evolves now with a discrete time process, which is the discretization of this stochastic differential equation. And, uh, and this velocity is a velocity, the same function applied component-wise. So it's v applied to x1, blah, 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 v applied to xn. And the intuition, if I follow what I was saying before, is that each xti at time t should be the cavity field at vertex i for state at level t. I still did that. Now, to match this SD, I want to construct u that has a statistics similar to the Brownian motion. Okay, so I want to construct a sequence of vector u's that is similar to the Brownian, Brownian motion. So at different times must be essentially orthogonal, and, and any given time must be Gaussian. Of course, there are a you know, number of ways of doing this. You can just generate Gaussian noise, but this will not give you a good solution of the model. Uh, it must depend in, on g some, somehow. Okay, so this U that behaves like a Brownian motion is the increment of this cavity field must, must you know, be correlated with G. So U is basically related to the change in cavity field when you go from one state to the next. Okay, so for constructing this, this, uh, this U, I use this uh, uh, AMP algorithm. Mm -hmm. So this was mentioned again in the morning, uh, already in the morning, but I construct this you know, by this specific implementation. So I, I multiply by g, and then I use my up update function to be some g hat Adamard u. So Adamard is component-wise product. Mm -hmm. And uh, OK, so over the last uh, you know, several years, we have uh, developed a general enough analysis that we can analyze this type of iteration very precisely, asymptotically, as n goes to infinity for t fixed. Uh, and, and you get that for, as n goes to infinity, the joint distribution of u at two different time is normal with some covariance that you can explicitly compute. And uh, OK, perhaps I'll skip this. But uh, uh, the end of the day is that this construction of the update is chosen in such a way to make these two orthogonal. So you can make the calculation and show that now subsequent update of this uh, increment u at different time is orthogonal. So it's very strange somehow. You're constructing a sequence of orthogonal increment. This doesn't lead anywhere, but they are because they are the increment that go from one state to the other. So this is related to, uh, I guess, what uh, Dimitri was talking about in the morning. OK, once you have this, what you do is the following. OK, now you constructed this process x that has the velocity and then you know, 
the Brownian motion that is updated to this uh, AMP iteration, and then you integrate it. Uh, so this is Brownian motion. Now we want to construct this Z, and we do it by replacing B by U and uh, capital X by lowercase x. In the end, I take the sign of what I get. And the theorem at the end of the day is that if you do this, this achieves an energy that is exactly the energy in the control problem for V and G, large system limit. So something very interesting happens is that this energy that achieves somehow depends on the whole history of the stochastic differential equation. So at each time, G describes really the, how much you increase in energy from one step to the other in expectation, the expectation of G. OK, so especially for this uh, you know, workshop, I, I decided to program this, uh, this thing, because I wrote the paper without programming anything. So I decided by pro to program. So this is on a simulation on a system of sites 10 to the 4. This is, I take four, uh, five vertices at random, and I plot the evolution of their local effect or local cavity fields. I mean, this is not cavity, I should say. These are you know, effective fields. And you know, they follow some, some random path. These are the local magnetization. And the intuition is the algorithm is descending a branch in the ultrametric tree. And this, as it descends, this branch is tracking the evolution of the local fields. And this is the energy that it achieves. So this is for 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, 8,000. And it extrapolates well with the you know, finite size correction of the ground state energy. So the ground state energy, you know, people often say or think that you know, has correction n to the minus 2 thirds. This too seems to have the, the same correction and seems to extrapolate something very close to p star. Okay, so in case you are not uh, convinced by proofs, this is, you know. So you can, of course, once you have the algorithm, you can you know, plot all sorts of fun things about it. For instance, you can plot the histogram of this local effective field as this time evolves. So this time, again, describes the descent through the ultrametric theory, or equivalent, the overlap. Right? So these are plots that, that, uh, that we saw already. I mean, that, OK, at least. Uh, uh, in theory, but uh, you know, now they are really describing the evolution of, the, of an algorithm. At small time, the effective fields are roughly Gaussian, but then there is this hole that, uh, that develops at zero. And the, the red curve are the theoretical prediction that come from the you know, classical papers, if you want. OK, so this, this is, uh, concludes my description of, an algorithm, of the algorithm. I'll take one minute to describe a couple of open problems. Um, of course, how does it behave, these constants behave with epsilon? What is the complexity of finding the exact ground state? And there is an, a very interesting problem from a CS perspective that is certifying ground states. What does it mean, certifying ground states? It means you find an algorithm that gives you an upper bound and the upper bound must be correct on any instance, and as good as possible for random instances. Okay? An example of such an upper bound is the maximum eigenvalue of G. The maximum eigenvalue is always an upper bound, but it's not very good on random instances. On random instances, it is, it is you know, 1 comparing to 0 0.76. Now, very interestingly, there is a couple of recent papers that you know, show evidence that there might not be anything better than this. Okay? So if you have an idea to upper bound the, ground, the, the energy better than the eigenvalue, uh, that would be very interesting to computer scientists. OK, um, okay the uh, optimization in RSB is a long history, and, uh, and Mark uh, reviewed it and started in this building, in part. Uh, and uh, yeah, I cited, uh, you know, I give three papers, in particular, uh, you know, three of my favorite papers. In particular, this paper put forward the idea of using RSB in the context of message passing algorithms. Here, you know, we are basically following the same idea. Uh, the novelty that I think is exciting is that in this case, we can prove that this actually uh, works. And we don't know of anything else that works for this model, probably. Okay, thank you.
pictures will be taken by seeing them because as you have noticed, my eyes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So which is the set number of the extrapolation? Um, okay, and the set number of this, so here I did list square, and I got it with the, so the, the right thing is, I think it's one in it or two in a thousand below. So I, if I rem, it's, it's P star minus 0 0.001, I think. It's something like seven, 760, 760, right? Uh, now, it's mostly due because of the last point, as you see, which is 8,000. If you, if you use only the first three points, it extrapolates almost exactly to right one. But the last point is, so now what happens is that as you go to larger, if you see the algorithm it uses as an input, uh, the solution of the Parisi problem of the variational principle. Okay, so I, I wrote my own code for solving the variational principle, and uh, I solved it to uh, I think I solved it to four digits, no, I four, uh, perhaps to five digits. But as you increase the accuracy, that last point goes slowly upwards. So the co current program that I have gets there. I mean, I think that if I spend uh, couple of days of computer time, it will go a little bit upward. But yeah, I mean, it would be interesting too. Could you say something about the, what, what is the status as far as rigorous things about the n to the minus two thirds? Well, that's just a I, don't, I don't know anything about it. I don't think there is any rigorous yeah. thing. Uh, it's uh, just a conjecture. I just, I just looked up in the, in the literature. There is a paper by, in particular, Enzo and others where they do simulations and it fits well. So I had to do a fit and did this. But this is the algorithm, not, not the yeah, so this is, this is uh, you know, the algorithm might have a different scaling, right? What I prove is only that it goes. This is for the algorithm. Yeah, this is for the algorithm. It's not the real ground state. So the algorithm might go much more slowly than the real ground state, right? Uh, so I don't know how the, this is an open problem, how the algorithm scales to, to, to to the ground state energy. It might be slower. But yeah, it's somehow surprisingly that is the same uh, thing that, yeah. Is there a way to generalize the analysis to distribution which is not Gaussian or GIG or something else? No, no, the, 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 the fact that the distribution is Gaussian doesn't really matter because, uh, I mean, so as long as it is, um, as long as it is, uh, for instance, uh, zero mean, uh, unit uh, second moment and uh, say sub Gaussian, uh, you know, the analysis of it. So, the only point where I use the distribution of the coupling is uh, in the analysis of the AMP, and that we have it for other uh, distributions like sub Gaussians, right? Now, it will break down when you go to sparse, uh, included plus minus one. It will break down when you go to sparse case, okay? Of course, because we know it should break down. Yeah. We say you can adapt the analysis to constant satisfaction problem in the dense regime so that it's right. okay for refutation of uh, dense CSP. Uh, well, now, this will work. I mean, OK, so the first question is, I mean, this uses, I, I, I've hidden a little bit in the exposition, but in the step one, when I, I do this thing, at, So there is this step where I check that uh, I check that uh, that this energy at V star G star is equal to the Parisian energy. Here I use the fact that this has full RSB, and in particular I use the no gap property. So if there is a gap in the distribution, this step will break down. I think for sure. Now, the question is, can we extend it to cases, other cases in which there is no gap in the distribution? And the first case, of course, would be to do the mixed p-spin. And then perhaps the second would be to go do uh, constraint satisfaction problems that are uh, dense, but they should be full RSB with no gap in the distribution. The real, the real crucial property is no gap in the distribution. So that is you know, foreseeable, but you know, it needs to be done.
Yeah, they generate one low energy configuration. Okay, now, yeah, so the algorithm is, uh, you know, also this is a little bit hidden but in the presentation, but there's a random initialization. A good question is, what happens if I change this random initialization? My conjecture is that you'll end up in, in different things, right? But I didn't prove this, but I would guess that you end up in different near ground states. So probably you can get other, but this is, yeah, it's, it's a good question for future work, I think. Uh, uh, no, no, I didn't. That, that I can do with, uh, with the program. But, uh, yeah. Maybe I should warn the audience. We have got such an interesting seminar with an overflow of questions. We are not going to shorten the other speakers. We are going to shorten the coffee break. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so 